They say that to make a small fortune in the wine business, you need to start with a large one. But Dario Satui started his winery on a shoestring budget and created one of the largest fortunes in Napa. His approach was unique, and he truly understood what most wine lovers actually wanted. This is the story of V. Satui Winery. Well, we have a great history. In fact, this year we're celebrating our 125th anniversary of the founding of the winery in San Francisco in 1885. And the winery was first started by Vittorio Satui. He came from Genoa, Italy, uh, came to San Francisco like most Italians, ended up in North Beach. And uh, he really wasn't uh, a winemaker by trade. Of course, Italians all made wine. Love drinking. And love drinking, but he was a baker. Okay. And, uh, and, and he had a boarding house, and, and finally his friend said, you know, Vittorio, you really ought to get in the wine business. Your wine's pretty good. And so in 1885, right on Columbus Avenue, North Beach, the winery opened. So the Satui Winery was started in the years just after the gold rush, when German and Italian immigrants came to the West Coast and brought their culture of winemaking to the Americas. And the grapes all came from St. Lena, right here in the Napa Valley, and sold wine pretty much just in San Francisco. And a lot of people don't understand or realize that most of the wineries here in the late 1800s weren't in the Napa Valley. They actually were in San Francisco. You're right. And if that's where the market was. Exactly. That's where commerce right. was. So rather than bringing cases of wine on right. wagon to San Francisco, right. they brought it down by wagon and grapes, by boat across the bay, made wine the city, and delivered it by wagon and the Demijohns. It can't have been easy making wine back in those days. It wasn't like they had the technology and the machinery that we have today. Pretty much everything had to be done by hand, and wearing those three-piece suits in the blistering heat must have been unbearable. And then suddenly, with the stroke of a pen, the whole business collapsed. And then a very bad thing happened, as you know, a thing called prohibition. But Vittorio says, I will not break the law, and he shut the winery down. And uh, part of the family went back to Italy, uh, but they had made a lot of money. The winery actually had done very well up until Prohibition, and so it went dormant for some years. And so it wasn't until the early 70s that the great-grandson, Dario Satui, had the great idea of starting over the winery. You have to try and imagine a place where there was only a few dozen wineries, almost no tourists, and hardly anyone in America even drank wine. But this didn't seem to phase Dario. Back in the 60s and early 70s, the wine business here in California, you know, it was just, it was starting over again, but it's not like anything we know today. So he came here to the Napa Valley. Of course, he had nothing going for him. He didn't know anything about wine. He, uh, he liked to drink it, and he, and he had no money. So what he did is he came up and worked at, at some wineries, got his business plan together and eventually raised about 50 some thousand dollars. And even at the time, UC Davis was saying, look, if you're gonna start a winery, you need like a million dollars. But he had this great idea. You know, he knew if he was gonna be successful in the industry, he had to sell wine direct. And, and that's he started. And, and he did something that no one's probably done in the wine business, and that is he made money his first year. Wow, yeah, not, that's not, very rare. Not oh. much, but it was small amounts of wine selling direct to the consumer. And all these years, we haven't changed. And to this day, every bottle of Visa Tui wine is sold only from the winery or via mail order or via the internet. Dario's other big idea was to build a place where people could come and have a casual picnic lunch and relax under the tall oak trees. So he built a deli that is stocked with over 200 different types of cheeses, where all the bread, pasta and pizza is made fresh daily by the resident Italian chef, and where they have barbecues going on at the weekends and all kinds of fun release parties where the wine really flows. And it was here that Dario showed his understanding of what most wine lovers actually really want. Opus One is not for everyone. Although Dario was off to a good start with a great idea, it wasn't exactly easy in the early days. In the beginning years, you're asking, you know, how many visitors did we get? We got very few. And, and I've been here close to 30 years, 
Uh, we had to eat on the picnic grounds. It looked like we had customers. Uh, <laughs> Dario's uh, <laughs> father, who was a retired cab driver, uh, would sit on the picnic grounds and he would be the shill, you know, to get people to come in. And we'd park our cars in the front of the lot, the employees would. Right. So, you know, hey, it looks like we got a full lot, right. but they're all employees. Right. And, uh, and so, because we didn't have any money for advertising, you know, no money for promotion. It was all built by word of mouth of making small lots of wine, making really good wine, and selling it at a great value. Many winery owners become fixated on creating the absolute highest quality wines possible and then charge an arm and a leg for them. But another approach is to produce very good quality wine and charge a very reasonable price for it. In my experience, most wine lovers simply want to have a nice bowl of wine, some good casual food and fun times. And that is the secret of Dario Satouille.